All right, I think we should start now. Um, welcome to the final day of the workshop. Um, today we're going to be um, searching about the journals and publication publications uh, more, and we're going to be talking less about the formatting and the writing portion. Now, for the publication part, before I get to that, I just wanted to shortly review what we studied yesterday and uh, to make sure that we touch base. Um, even before that, I just quickly want to ask if there are any questions uh, about yesterday that you do not understand, uh, if there are any confusions, um, queries. Um, I'm happy that I've seen quite a vibrant chat in the WhatsApp group, which is a good sign that you guys are understanding and asking questions and this is a process for uh, growth and intellectual stimulation. Um, that's very good that it's happening. Um, but if you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer um, before I actually go ahead and um, kick off the session today. So no questions? Can everyone hear me? Um, you can write in chat at least so I would know. All right, perfect. So let's go ahead and actually get to a um, quick recap of what we did yesterday. And uh, Julie built that there was no prerequisite for the workshop. Um, we also studied that um, it's going to be a role play playing workshop where I would actually ask you to repeat the process um, or ask um, questions if you do not understand um, how to replicate what I have done. And um, then we also studied about um, learning complete papers. I have already shared the A4 template for the APA 6 um, style paper and that are acceptable in almost um, all journals um, in social sciences and um, psychology to be specific because more students are uh, from psychology discipline here. Um, we also studied about tools that you could use uh, for improving your writing. Um, that was a paraphrasing tool called Killbot. And we also studied about Rough and Write, that's a Microsoft Word add-in. Um, we also studied about Grammarly, where you could actually input the style of writing that you want to write in, and then it's going to give you the feedback on um, how your write, writing sounds like. Um, to someone who is a native English speaker. Um, it's not 100% correct. Um, I've been reading your discussion and you're right. If you do not know the grammar yourself, uh, Grammarly cannot help you a lot. Um, so just want to make sure that before you actually use this tool, um, understand the limitations of any tool that could be in place of, if you do not know what you want yourself. So that means that Grammarly can only help you as much as you understand the syntax of English grammar. Um, also, it's going to be interactive. And that means that you will have to share your screen and uh, reproduce uh, what you have learned. Again, there is nothing wrong with doing things uh, wrong, especially if you want to learn how to do it right. So I'm here to actually walk you through the steps so that you can learn on your own. And then we also um, talked about the fact that you're going to get a certificate. Um, uh, today, we're going to be discussing the part where you find the right journal to publish your research in and how to read the submission guidelines for authors. So today, I'm going to actually open up um, different journal websites and I'll show you um, the author submission guidelines that you'll have to follow in order to get published in that specific journal. Now, um, I hope that everyone has already seen the recording of the workshop um, we did yesterday. Um, and there 
was no issues with that. If anyone has any problems, let me know and I'll try to fix it for them. Um, if not, just review that workshop uh, again and again um, so that you could walk on your own base and understand all the concepts in that. If you still have any questions, um, you can contact me in the group um, or on Facebook or anywhere, and I'd be more than happy to clarify some of the concepts that you don't understand. Um, all right, sorry, we can uh, talk about Auric ID also um, when we are looking at journals. Uh, just remind me and I'll um, show you how it works. Uh, so you also have templates for AP style research paper and you also have the re review template. Um, and uh, as um, always, if you want to understand the qualitative research using NVivo and uh, some of the quantitative um, work and um, tools like SPSS or Smart PLS, um, you can always have recording of our previous workshops. Now, uh, these are some of the benefits. I don't think I have to go over it again. And uh, finally, we studied briefly about Google Scholar, how to use that. I actually walked you through the process of filtering um, the results based on year, author, and um, institutes in Web of Science. I um, also showed you the book search, WordCat, and I also showed you the Stanford thesis repository um, search words. Um, we also learned about Sci-Hub and um, the Genesis free sources to find research papers that um, you are not able to find through Google Scholar and are um, paid and restricted access papers. Um, some of the resources where you could actually collaborate and get free resources is Stackflow and Reddit forums and MIT coursework website where you can get a lot of um, material regarding your discipline and research that could be beneficial in your own um, research. Um, again, um, the importance of uh, learning online from YouTube tutorials and online workshops and how it's a better medium in comparison to um, traditional universities. Um, we also shared the book that um, I'm using for the preparation of this workshop. Um, it's um, Evergreen book on research papers, thesis, and dissertations called The Manual for Writers by Kate Turabian. I've already shared that in the group. And then we also study about uh, finding your uh, question in your topic and um, proposing some pre preliminary answers to your research question, planning how to get the answers, and finally, um, how to go through the sub, um, research process without actually um, becoming frustrated about that. So today we're going to be studying about, now that you have finally written your paper, so you've got everything right, um, you're excited to publish it. Um, how to publish it, where to publish it, and how to actually format your paper according to the journal that you're publishing, publishing in. So for example, if you're publishing in engineering discipline, the journal that you're submitting your paper in will have different guidelines uh, for the engineering paper in comparison to social sciences or hard sciences. And that um, specifically depends on the journal that you are submitting your paper in. So um, let's go ahead and actually see how it looks like. I'm going to show you a sample journal and where to find the submission guidelines. So I'm going to go ahead and share the screen. Can you, everyone see the new screen? All right, perfect. So um, we have this journal, it's called British Journal of Social Psychology and it's published by the British Psychological Society. Um, the publisher is the Wiley Online Library. Um, you can create your own account also for login. So um, if you do not find this page, you can simply write um, International Journal of Social Psychology in Google and it's going to open up. And from there onwards, for example, it's um, see if you go from home 
and then you can find the author submission and guidelines, then you will end up on this page. So right on this page, you see that um, there is submit an article tab here, and then you can also see the free samples to find out how do you actually format your paper according to the samples uh, given to you so that you have an idea of uh, the formatting and um, text, line spacing, and everything else. Uh, if you want to get alerts for journals, new papers, you can also sub subscribe for that, and you can also subscribe um, in general for um, new volumes coming out. Now, uh, when you see the sections here, so it gives you a very, very detailed outline um, of how to format your manuscript before you actually submit your uh, manuscript. Uh, so let's start with the submission first. Uh, it's good. Most prestigious journals, they have their online uh, version where you could go and submit your um, journal and you will have receipt of that and then it goes into review process. So uh, when you submit your submission, it is prepared in accordance with the author guidelines. It should be submitted on this link, editorialmanager.com, BJSP. So every journal has its own link where you could actually publish that. And then you have to read all other information about um, journals, how to actually um, format your paper according to that. For, for example, let's go step by step. Uh, if you want to know more about the journal itself, you read Aims and Scope, you can see that um, the topics that it includes uh, for publishing is group processes, intergroup relations, self and identity, language and discourse, attitude, social cognition, and everything else. And the kind of papers they publish, they also tell you in the guidelines that they publish empirical papers that address theoretical issues. And it could include analysis of existing social psychological theories. It could be extensions. It could be integrations. Uh, it could also publish the review papers uh, that evaluates the current literature in a certain area. Uh, it could be methodological papers and concerning a specific technique. And it could be the landmark as the first article in the part of every volume. And it could be different categories. So you, before you actually go ahead and submit your manuscript in a journal, you need to make sure that your manuscript fits into the guidelines of that journal because your chances of becoming accepted are dramatically increased if your manuscript aligns with the journal aimed and objective. Now you, that you have read about the manuscript categories and requirements, um, you also have to read the um, submission and preparation um, format. So every journal has its own format. Some of uh, the journals actually give you a template for that. For example, you can see this, um, that you may like to use this template for your title page. So you're gonna go ahead and open that template. And it's going to download that in the Word file. So if I open that file, it's going to show you In a minute, let me actually switch to the Word document so that I can show you the submission format. Okay, does everyone see that now? All right, so you see to publish in that journal, you have to f format your paper in this format. So you have a title on top, and if you have a short title, you can give um, just under that. Uh, it should be centered in the middle of the page, and then you have first author, second author, third author. Note that the corresponding author who's going to be communicating with the journal um, about the updates and other um, communications, um, they have a star with the first author on top of it. 
um, you see the exponential sign first here also. And you have to add the corresponding author information here. It could be name, postal address, country, email address. Um, for the author, you also have to add the affiliation. For example, if you're working for a research institute um, or a public or private sector university or you're an independent consultant or anything, you can write your affiliations here. Corresponding author is someone, Sarah, that a uh, journal contributes, uh, I'm sorry, communicates with um, in order to update them about the publication process um, and they will be notified about the acceptance or rejection or everything else. So there's only one author who's going to be communicating with the journal. Um, so, for example, if there are three people, journal is not going to communicate with all three people. There's going to be only one uh, corresponding author that journal is going to be talking with. Um, and then you have the abstract. You can paste your abstract in this format. Um, you can add your keywords of your research paper here so that it's easy for the algorithm to find your research paper for the people who are looking for relevant material. Um, and then you can also add a data availability statement. Of where is your raw data? So author would like to I'm sorry, the reviewers um, and the readers would like to see where your raw data is so that they can reproduce your research. Um, and then you have some acknowledgement if you want to acknowledge something. Um, so this is the template for the header that you would actually um, use uh, if you want to publish in Journal of uh, What's the journal again? British Journal of Social Psychology. Okay, so now we have uh, done with the formatting of the header. We're going to go and see the parts of the manuscript um, and how do we format uh, separate parts of that. So the main parts are the title page, the main text file, figures tables, and the other supporting information that you can have. What do you mean by rubric, Sarah? Um, well, in general, your keywords should actually represent the abstract um, or the research paper that you're writing. For example, if you're writing a research paper about borderline personality disorder, you could not actually write mechanical engineering in keywords because it's not going to furnish your results if you put a totally irrelevant keyword in your paper. So it has to be, um, it has to include the main words of your abstract or your research paper. Um, so it, you need to make sure that it's searchable by um, the search engines for that. Okay, so on the title page, make sure you have the short informative uh, title containing the major keywords um, and the short running title of less than 40 characters, full name, authors, abstract keywords, acknowledgements. Uh, there are further guidelines for authorship and abstract and keywords. Um, you can read that for the information. Let's go to the main text file. Uh, main text file contains the title, uh, which is the topic of your paper, and then the main text, like different headings, um, introduction, uh, methods, data collection, analysis, uh, discussion, and things like this. In the end, I already shared the template with you, um, and you know that in APA format, the tables and figures come in the end. Um, and with footnotes included in that. And if you have any appendices, you can also add that at the end of your paper. Um, for the references, there's also a guideline for which format to follow. For example, this um, specific journal actually wants you to publish uh, your citations in uh, the, manual uh, the manual for American Psychological Association, sixth edition, which is the style we use in psychology, APA6. Um, so you have to format that um, in APA6, and then they've already given you the samples of how to do that. And then um, they have different directions for samples, uh, and the stars actually donate the p-values if that's st uh, statistically strong enough or it's significant or not. And then uh, you can also see the figure guidelines where you actually have to make sure that your figures are um, readable and they're properly titled and annotated. You can also use color figures. Uh, some of them um, are charged if you want to publish a paper with colored 
papers, uh, colored uh, figures. And some of the time your institution actually pays for these publication fees, and especially if you want to make your paper um, open access, you have to pay some fee for journals to actually do that. Uh, in some cases, your institution, if and they're paying for that, you can opt for the color figures and also the open access charges. Um, there's other supporting information, and then there's um, some overview of the language, abbreviation, units of measure, effect size, and uh, other things that you, you would need. And there's also an ethical consideration page where you can read about the process through which your paper actually goes and what are the standard operating procedures for um, the specific journals. Uh, if there are any conflict of interest um, in your study, you have to report that uh, as mandated by the ethical standards of research publication. Um, if you have received funding for your paper from an institution, you have to mention that in that also. Uh, data availability um, means that the raw data that you ran your analysis in, for example, if you're running a quantitative analysis and you collected your data from somewhere, you need to upload your data to either the um, reviewers directly through the submission platform of the journal, or you have to upload it on a publicly available free data verse. For example, my raw data is available on Harvard University's um, Harvard Dataverse. Um, so that actual reviewers can download that data and run the analysis to see that uh, it's replicable so they can reproduce the data on their side. Uh, funding means that you know if someone is supporting your research, someone is paying for that. For example, if you are a PhD student um, and you're getting scholarship from university um, or a certain research institute, then you have to mention their name so that uh, people know that um, someone is funding your research. Uh, I can show you um, the data versus later also. Um, how do you upload your raw data there? Uh, one of the best thing you can do is, and that's like the highest level of um, research and quantitative analysis, um, that you use uh, the free software uh, R. Um, for that, you have to learn the R programming language and use R Studio um, or some other ID in which you could um, run the analysis on your data. And then you can send the our file to your supervisor or um, your colleagues or peer reviewers so that they can actually reproduce every step of your um, data analysis on their own end and so they would actually know that you know um, that data that you have collected is worthwhile and the analysis results in the same results that you have reported in your paper um, but that could be a uh, topic of another workshop um, but just to let you know that our is um, becoming very popular in data statistics um, and analysis. And you have to also declare about your authorship, about um, how much um, every author has contributed and you know, they're assumed to have contributed um, at least the same amount that everyone else has. And then there are other public ethics and there are a lot of other things. Uh, so they've also add the ORC ID so you can create your ORC ID, the researcher ID, and then you can report that um, with the submission and so that it gets indexed according to your ORC ID. Uh, and there are so many other guidelines um, that you can read, but basic purpose was to show you actually that um, where to find the author submission guidelines um, in on a journal website. So now that we're done with that, um, let's go to the uh, position back and let's talk about um, how much to publish. So this is a question that I get very frequently that um, how many research papers are enough? And the answer is that it's not about how much you have to publish, it's about how good your papers are. Um, Nobel Prizes have been won um, on just numerous research papers, but their impact was so high that um, they actually got the Nobel Prize for that. So this is what I keep telling people that, you know, publishing useless research um, does not serve any purpose. You know, it's not going to help you anyways. And also the material sciences like chemistry, physics, engineering, um, it's easier for them to publish research papers in comparison to social sciences. 
because um, the amount of data that these disciplines generate, it's huge. Uh, and their um, the quantitative analysis run on these um, data is easier to do. And, you know, it's easier to uh, make outputs out of your quantitative data. Uh, same is not true for social sciences because social sciences actually have the hard job to quantify the social behaviors and um, human psychology and have to make sure that their research actually fits in line with the social phenomena being observed. And it's a very hard job. You have to come up with something that's uniquely new and then you have to come up with a justification um, that your quantification exactly measures what you're observing. So it, it's the issue of validity. And so it's very important that you understand that in social sciences, it's hard to publish. Um, so it's not about the amount of papers that you have published, it's more about the quality of papers that you have published. Yes, sir, I'm going to tell you how to search and that also in a minute. And uh, there's another question about paid and unpaid journals. Now the paid journals are the journals that charges authors a small fee for, or sometimes not so small fee for publishing their papers in peer reviewed journals. Um, and then there are unpaid journals who would only accept your submission if that fits in the guideline um, of the journal. And then they are of unique quality and they uniquely contribute to scientific literature. And these are the paper um, that are very selective with what kind of papers they want to publish. So many of the journals um, that are on first quarter or second quarter um, in Scopus or in Web of Science, these journals um, are free journals, but they have very high requirements for academic publishing and your data has to be unique and it should significantly add to the scientific knowledge. Now for the paid journals, um, you can pay journals to actually publish your results and make it open access, um, but I would not suggest that unless you really have to because um, paid journals in academic community are looked down upon um, and they are not considered uh, a very nice um, showcase for your publications. Uh, but I wouldn't suggest you to do one or two, but if you can get paid in high quality journals and your research is original and it's contributing, then you should certainly go for a quarter one uh, high impact factor journals, uh, which are unpaid in reputable databases like um, Scopus and Web of Science. Uh, so Mira, I'll show you how impact factor is calculated um, shortly. It is um, basically a correlation of the number of citations uh, a paper gets in a journal and then uh, how many years it has been in existence um, and the quality of research. So it's, it's a complicated metric that I'm going to explain shortly, but for now, think of it as a quality score. The higher score that you have, the more reputable journal is. The lower score you have, and the less reputable journal you have. Yes, Sarah, even paid journals have good high impact factors, um, but it depends on what journal uh, you're talking about. So there are some of the journals, um, briefly to mention, um, that are paid and uh, you can get um, published in quite early in those journals um, if you absolutely have to do that. So it's International Journal of Scientific and Technology Research. The publication fee is $65 um, and it can take around 10 to 15 days um, before notification of acceptance or rejection. And Another journal is Journal of Engineering and Applied Science by Medwell Publishers. And a paper usually gets reviewed within two or three weeks time and the publication fees are around, around $350 to $500. Uh, and these are some of the journals um, as an example that you know they do exist if you want to publish a journal quick. As only I'm going to tell you about the... All right, welcome back everyone. Um, so to pick up from where we left, um, these were some of the journals that you could publish in sciences field. Um, 
and you know they were the paid journals. Um, now to add to your question about the impact factor and um, citations. Now this is a graph. Can everyone see that? Uh, Zim, you actually have to go to these um, journal websites to see if they're listed, but they're um, Scopus listed um, journals, uh, which is um, in majority of the cases enough uh, to be called high impact um, journals and uh, they're very reputed journals. Now for the uh, graph you see, on the x-axis, we have the papers. And then on right side, we have the citations. So the number of papers, the more you publish, um, you will go on right, and the more citations you have for your papers, you go on citations. So uh, now you see that, that somewhere here in the green line, if you you have an intercept here. That means that you know your paper for let for let's say it's two papers that you have published and you've got two citations for that. So your edge score for that will be calculated according to that. Um, so that's the edge score for individual um, authors that you um, get calculated. Now the first journal that we're going to be um, looking at, I'm sorry for the misspell actually here, um, is the Elsevier Journal Finder tool. Um, so let's go and show you how it works. Uh, well, Samara, some journals are not um, listed in um, the Scopus or they do not have long history enough to create an impact factor score. That depends on specific journal that you're asking about. Um, so that is why they won't um, have an impact score. But if that's listed in a database, it certainly will have an impact factor if it's been around for quite some time. So if you look at this um, journal final, Tool, it actually helps you find the right journal for the kind of paper that you're writing. For example, if you have a manuscript and you want to find out uh, if that is publishable um, in some journal and what journal do you want to publish in. So let's go ahead and insert a dummy paper that you want to publish for, let's make an assumption that it's your paper and we have to paste our title and then the abstract. So I have a paper that I'm putting the abstract of in the abstract section and then I'll put the keywords. So I'll put in the keywords. Let's go ahead and actually select the field first. But don't worry if you can cannot find the keyword um, already listed in the database, you can add the new ones also, or you can individually add that. So for example, my keyword is psychometrics, but since it's not there, you can select the relevant one. You can also add psychiatric disease. And then you can search for that. So after the search, um, it tells you that there are 50 journals that actually match your criteria where you can publish your journals in. Uh, and that one is French, so you probably would want to publish here unless your paper is in French. Um, that one is also in French. Um, that's in French also. And then you go to the English one. So if you look at this journal, that's called a Journal of um, Psychosomatic Research, and the exception rate is 23%. That means that Roughly all uh, submissions that are made to this journal, only 23% of them get submitted. Um, side score of a, a journal is um, uh, 
correlation of the citations from the papers in that journal and the number of years that has been around. So for example, if it's around for five years and the amount of citations it got, um, um, uh, ratio of that is called site score. Um, I can tell you site score um, uh, about it a little bit later, but let's focus on um, the journals that we, are pub we can publish our paper in. Uh, it also gives you the time to first decision. So for example, if you submit your paper today, it's going to take three weeks to get the first decision if your paper is publishable or not. Um, and the time to publication is four weeks. So that means that once you get your decision, it can be published in one week. Um, yes, Sarah, it's a little bit like impact factor, but impact factor could be one year impact factor and site score is um, the total um, impact factor for many years. Um, but it's a little bit confusing. I'm going to um, explain to you later. Um, and then you also have psychology of sport and exercise um, that might not might be more relevant to psychiatry, but you know, it's still one of the options. Um, and then you also have Asian of Asian Journal of Psychiatry with all the information, computers and human behavior. Um, and then it's also French Journal, also French Journal. And then Psychosomatics. So you see there are different journals that you could actually find uh, for your manuscript if you already have your manuscript ready. So simply go and add your um, title, your abstract, and your keywords in the Journal Finder tool by Elsevier and select the field of research and it's going to give you the most appropriate journals that you might want to publish in. And that was our first tool that you could um, use for publications in um, journals that are relevant and you don't know how to find the appropriate journal for your manuscript. Now, there's another tool, it's called the um, journal search by SciMago, and that's a very detailed tool on where is the most groundbreaking research happening at the moment. Um, it also visualizes uh, different research institutes and their insight score and their impact factors and, and things like this. So, so let me go ahead and show you the SciMag tool. So when you go to the SDR page and you will have these different options to select from if you want to select journals from a certain country or a certain year, um, subject wise, area wise, um, you can do that. You can also sort them according to open access, um, only um, style journals and other journals also. And you can also download data uh, for these um, searches so that you will have a representable tool. If I will just go ahead and add um, psychology in that, Yes, Sarah, so they divide um, different journals uh, into uh, four quartiles, uh, quartile one being the best and quartile four being the worst. So now you see the um, search according to psychology, the first paper that we have, we have the annual review of psychology. This is one of the best um, journals um, for psychology, depending on your content. And then we have a very famous journal, Personality and Social Psychology. Um, and all the journals that um, fall under psychology are listed here. So you can also rank them according to age index. It's going to show you the journal with higher age index. Um, we could also select with um, year, total, doc, uh, total publishing, uh, published papers in 2018 total references, sites, um, and the SGR ranking uh, for the journal. Um, and it's going to show you the country from which this um, journal is originating from. Um, and then more you can select an individual paper, I'm sorry, journal, and then can actually take you this um, journal information. So it started in 1917. So it's almost over, uh, it's over 100 years that this journal has been uh, published now. Um, so you can see it's high H index score of 249. Um, and then 
it can also show you um, the guidelines for how to publish in this journal. So you can click that and you can go to the your editorial manager. I can also show you the citation score. Um, sorry, the H index is exactly the same uh, thing for H score, but it's for journals in which it's a combination of the number of citations uh, it has uh, in a number of year or over lifetime in and the total number of papers that it publishes. Uh, you can also find more about um, H index site scores and impact factors uh, if you do a little Google search on that um, and it gives you exact matrix of how um, these um, things are calculated per year or over the lifetime. Um, it also shows you the um, self-citing scores and that how many times journal actually cites its own papers. Um, it can show you the SGR ranking over the period of 10 years or since 1999, so how it goes up and down and things like that. And there's so many other matrices you can look from. Um, you can see the citable scores, the international collaboration. Uh, you can see the international, international collaboration for the journal is actually going up um, throughout. and. Uh, the percentage um, of international collaboration, at least in 2018, was 41%. So that means that you know, most of the um, journal authors came from outside the U.S. in this journal. And it's also a quarter one journal. It shows you which quartile it fits in. Um, and um, you can also see the SGR ranking for that. So that was uh, the um, SIM. Mag tool for finding a journal. Uh, you can also use another tool. It's called Journ, um, and that's a million of uh, free articles, chapter, and thesis you can find, and um, you can also see where they're published. So, for example, if you want to find journals on, um, let's say, schizophrenia. You can find different um, articles um, on the search results page um, that take you to the article page and it also will take you the institute um, or the um, organization that has published the articles. Uh, so Journ is also a good tool for finding uh, not only articles and chapter and thesis that are freely available uh, through the um, search results. And then finally, uh, not finally, actually, I've got a lot more. Um, we go to the Web of Science, uh, which is the best uh, database for uh, finding relevant articles. Um, so that's a tool uh, of Web of Sciences. Uh, it's called Insight. So if I go to the other page, you see this is the front page of Web of Science, which I showed you yesterday, where you could actually find research papers. Within that, you have insights to find um, how many times a certain article has been um, cited or what are the top journals. So if you see here that uh, the best in journals um, or magazines ever to publish your scientific um, research in our nature and science, um, and they've been around for such a long time, they're the standards for academic accomplishment. And then you also have the PLOS um, and National Academy of Sciences of the US, and there are um, others uh, a lot also. So you can see many of these um, journals and magazines are having high impact factor because they've been around for um, sometimes over 100 years, uh, like you've seen previously. And many of these actually publish material sciences, engineering, or hard sciences um, results because these are e easy to generate and you know these are unique scientific contributions um, and social science is a little bit hard um, but not as much in comparison so there's another tool uh, that you can use for web of science which is called master journalist here you can search for journals uh, from different domains you can enter the name of journal and you can search uh, and it's going to give you all the journals that has been indexed in Web of Sciences. And then you can read their information about impact factor scores, its scores, um, and their overall history, international contribution, which quartile they belong to, and so many other things. Um, now, like I showed you with the journal finder, you can also use the match manuscript service from Web of Science um, 
to find out what journals are more likely to publish your research based on your abstract, your keywords, and your title. I'm not going to go into that because uh, I've already showed you how to do that in Journal uh, Finder in Elsevier. So remember, there are two big um, journal um, databases. One is the Scopus, which is uh, founded by Elsevier, and then we have, then we have Web of Science, where you could do that. And there are other free versions, but these are the top um, two largest ones that you can find. Um, then we also have Google Scholar, of course, where you could find um, the papers and it's going to tell you what journals um, they're published in. Um, so that's one tool that you could use. Another one is Sightseer, uh, and that also gives you different tools for uh, finding the relevant research papers in the journals and that they're published in. Um, so you can simply go to sites here and you can also search for authors here. So you can see uh, different schools um, who are publishing in the domain of psychology. Um, and you can also include citation results if you want to. So one of the most uh, prolific a paper publisher in this domain is Department of Psychology at um, University of California, Berkeley. And then we also have University of Texas, Austin, um, we call it Cambridge, um, and a lot of other de departments. And this is Pennsylvania State University. Uh, I'm working uh, with a professor in Pennsylvania State University also um, in one of my papers. Um, you can see that in a research kit. Uh, so these are some of the uh, top institutions around the world that are working in um, psychology. Um, now, if you are from medical sciences, so some of you, if you are in um, psychiatry where um, there's a lot of input from the hard medical science, you can um, select the database of PubMed and it also indices and top papers uh, from the medical uh, field and it publishes it there. And it's funded by the National Institution of Health um, in US. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. Um, even the ones who are not particularly in the hard sciences. Um, so in that database, you can search uh, many of the papers that are published by the Institute um, and then you can drill your search down um, based on uh, different sources like PLOS One, Nature, and Lancet that I've talked about earlier. Uh, for psychology specifically, um, there's um, a tool called SAR, uh, SAI Archives, and here you can um, add your preprints. Uh, for example, if you have a manuscript, you can upload that on SciR VIX to make sure that you know um, it receives a digital identifiers. This is my paper that I'm writing with um, the Penn State professor, Dr. John Johnson, um, and uh, I've uploaded the manuscript here uh, that people can read and you know, give their feedback. Uh, if you can see, you know, uh, under the abstract, I have this digital identifier for my paper, and that is called the DOI. And these days, all your papers are identified with DOI, and you have to submit that um, to journals if you already have that. Uh, and then there are some um, metadata about disciplines and different tags and the different citation formats it's going to look like uh, once it's published. Now, um, having said that, these are the majority of the tools that um, I wanted to tell you about in order to find the right journal that you want to publish in. Now, uh, I can also find the, if you, some of you are actually working, um, finding, trying to find the people who are working in the domain and who are doing the top class research, um, you can go to the visualization tool um, for the SGR and find out the institution that are working in your field. Uh, so what you can do is you can open the realization tool. And by the way, the, the data that SciMagal gets is from Scopus, which is um, the Elsevier's database for the research papers. Um, sorry, there are many ways to do that. You can um, send them an email um, or contact them on 
research kit, um, read their papers and give their feedback, uh, try to publish your own research, tag them. Uh, you have to be very proactive and find relevant uh, research and um, talk to people that uh, are in your field. For example, this is a visualization for uh, the journals uh, Inside Psychology um, that I have already drilled down. Just a minute, it's a little slow here. Actually, go ahead and load it again. Uh, while it loads in it, let me expand a little bit on how you contact uh, foreign professors. Um, first of all, you need to make sure that you publish something of um, real good quality and the foreign professors can actually read it on your profile um, before you do that because they're very busy and they do not have time for um, occasional conversations. Um, so make sure that you have a ResearchGate account. Make a ResearchGate account, uh, upload your research that you've already done on that. Um, and then you can share this research with other um, researchers in the field where, who are working um, in the field for a long time. And you can ask for their feedback and ask if you can uh, do a combined research with them if your interest aligns with them. And you can ask them if you can get them some data um, from Pakistan or wherever you can find this data in. Um, or if there are other services that you can provide them like data um, analysis or wrangling or if you're good with coding, so make sure that you are of value for them. Um, so just do not contact them out of um, habit because um, that is not what you want to do. You want to make sure that you know uh, these people would like to take you on their team based on your talents and your quality of work. I have no idea what's going wrong with this page. I'm trying to go ahead and open it again. Okay, that was for the Scopus. So here you can see the country ranking page also. And I'm just going to go ahead and see if we can do the visualization tool again. Yeah, I think this is what I'm looking for, the country graph. So here you see the scientific output of um, different regions that you're trying to work in. Um, so now that we know that most of the scientific output is coming from either China, US, um, and that's uh, the on the scale of uh, scientific output from one to 683K. Um, you can select with different areas. For example, if you want to drill down uh, who are the top producing countries or regions in psychology? Uh, it's, it's predominantly US. Um, we can also see the index publication maps for that. Okay. 
and we can select, let's say we want to find out um, the areas in Western Europe where the research is being done. So see most of the work um, is happening in UK with 270 publications and then we have um, in Germany with 58 publications, Finland with one and Norway with one. So now you can drill down the area that you are um, interested in um, according to the map and find where can you likely find the people that you're going to be working with uh, or you're interested in. You can also create a scatter plot for that. And you know, which are the top countries in research according to their scientific output and the index publications. So that was the uh, brief outlook um, overview of the um, SciMag SGR tool to find out uh, what journals and what areas that you need to focus on. Now, so far, um, are there any questions? I'm uh, sure, so I'm going to go ahead and actually unmute you. All right, you have the mic. Um, I have a question like, uh, you know, we go through impact factor and everything, but the thing is that the institutes, they put so much pressure on us to get publications, you know, the fast publications, and at the same time, uh, we are stuck in a dilemma that if you go for paid publications, that is going to go completely against your reputation, you know. So how do you manage that on your CV? Because yes, last time we were discussing in the WhatsApp group and then somebody said to me, no, and nobody goes into that much of the detail. But when I see myself from the foreign perspective, they do go into your details that which one is paid and which one is unpaid, you know. And then there is a timeline pressure. How do you handle all this? Um, I think that's more of an individual um, situation question. Um, I, for myself, and I only focus on the kind of research that I'm passionate about. I have this um, big five personality test that I'm working with um, a professor emeritus in Penn State University. Um, and frankly, that we were doing, um, we're writing a paper about that. Uh, but Personally, the publications for me um, do not matter as much because I prefer to publish more in conferences um, and other places where I could interact um, with other researchers who are doing the groundbreaking work. So for me, it's no, a matter of my, actually, no, no, I'm not asking in the in, in the context of individuality. What what I meant to ask was, but the, when you're working as an assistant professor or professor or lecturer, there is always pressure from the institutes, you know, like in my institute, they give you a six month deadline and every six months you need to have a publication. Do you think that is possible? And it should be a good quality one. And for me, I find it very, like for me, it's impossible. You know, you need to start working uh, years before even joining an institute. You know, um, get, yeah. I was coming to that. Um, so I was just explaining that for me, it's a personally not a problem if I publish or not, but you know, that's uh, how it is in most of the institutions um, with um, any repute at all. You know, they want their professors to publish something. But the problem with Pakistani academia is that they don't understand that the requirements that they're putting on their faculty um, have some prerequisites. Uh, for example, if you're an associate or assistant professor in U.S. universities, you would only have limitations on the classes that you have to teach, and then you will be given uh, fundings for that. And, you know, you have to interact with professor so you will have plenty of time for that so if you're putting a deadline of six months you need to make sure that um, people are free enough to do that and most of these get um, institutions don't even give you the access to um, paid databases like web of science um, and other places um, so the institution that I work for also and I'm gladly I don't work there as 
um, full time faculty or otherwise it's it was it, it would become too overwhelming with all the politics and everything else um, yes and um, exactly ex exactly so this is what I was coming to you it's academia it, it's unfortunately it's not as prestigious as it used to be um, so what people do is um, that they find some paid journals and Paid journals are not necessarily bad journals, you know, they're indexed in Scopus and uh, Web of Science, uh, and they're good journals also. Um, all they do is that they charge you for the open access fee, which is that everyone can read your paper and you can retain your copyrights without actually forget, uh, forgoing anything at all. Um, and then they give you a faster um, return time in case of um, the acceptance or rejection um, decision. So that's not, not necessarily as bad. Um, but the problem is that uh, you cannot produce world class research um, every six months um, and you're still coping with a lot of classes and grading. You don't even have teaching assistants. Uh, I'm not assuming anything about you, but um, based where no, I No, I don't you. have any. Exactly. I'm, that's like, I'm, I'm teaching like online, I'm teaching 18 hours per week and I'm like dead by this time like you know so uh, i have a really because my data is there my research work is there i don't even have the energy to compile everything to make it be, you know make it like like a good piece of work you know because uh, the energy is so much drained out that at the time you want to just get rid of what you have collected and everything okay my second question oh did i interrupt you i need to ask you a second question no no uh, i hope that yeah. you know my answer has been satisfactory Yes, thank you. But uh, my second question, can I uh, collaborate with you at some point when it comes to research? Yeah, I was thinking about that, actually. Your field is quite similar um, with business psychology and um, yes, your background. Yes, um, I, yeah, I have a lot of ideas. And when I saw your book on the Facebook, I was so overjoyed and was so excited. So I immediately bought it. So I have a couple of ideas. So, you know, I was just thinking whether you'll be able to like you know, collaborate with me. I'm sure I'd be more than happy actually. I haven't seen your work. Uh, I don't know if you have an account on research work, um, research gate or academia or everywhere uh, or anywhere else. So you know, I would have an insight into the kind of interest that uh, you have um, uh, and your PhD dissertation. So it would be interesting actually to look and find some um, common areas. Um, since you're also working in clinical psychology now, is it a master's or are you doing the ADCP? What's that? Oh, I just finished my PhD and I'm doing my ADCP. I did my master's in clinical psychology from Beacon Hill National University and then I did my PhD. I didn't do MPhil because I did my PhD with coursework, so it was a five years of PhD. And then I recently came back and then I was fortunate enough to get a job. <laughs> Yeah, and then uh, then I just wanted to complete my ADCP because I have to go through the psychometric testing and all those things. So the coronavirus hit and all my plans got, you know. Okay. So I'm just playing my theoretical part. It's very interesting yeah. that, you know, you have some interest in psychometrics because um, it's kind of disappointing that, you know, people even in psychology department here, they don't really understand the basic concepts of uh, factor analysis and exploratory factor analysis and how to do the... Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yes, yes. Exactly. Exactly. I agree. So um, <laughs> if, you, if you do understand that, it's going to be very interesting because uh, I don't know if you have already um, looked on um, my big five page. Um, so we translated this and I just got the email today with my collaborator. Um, there, that, there's another American professor that I'm working with. Uh, on the structure validity of the Urdu version of that, I just got results today that you know in some cases um, the internal internal consistencies of the Urdu version is even better than the English one. Um, so it's very interesting. I'm interesting. going to be yeah. publishing the uh, preprint very soon. But uh, one of the things that you can do right off uh, the bat is that uh, if you can ask your students to take the test. Um, so that we would have different profiles and then we could do something about uh, a paper about their academic achievement and um, their personality styles because this experiment has been very prolific here um, where I applied this uh, psychometric testing in schools on undergraduates and then graduates 
and we found out that their um, productivity and their um, performance uh, went through the roof. So they, after that, the faculty was really surprised and they um, asked me to train the whole faculty for that, which I did. Um, so that's something we can probably collaborate with Comsats also. That's where you teach, right? Yeah, and and I, I I don't want to take other participants' time. I hope I'm not taking their part. Um, you know, the other thing that I really want to uh, collaborate with is in the Rift Psychological Wellbeing Scale, those six dimensions of the psychological well-being. Uh, uh, those EFA, and I did it in a highly structured, monitored environment, and their scales were com quite completely different. But I really don't know how to put that everything in a paper, you know. The information is too much that I feel lost now. Yeah, so, I mean, the, generally the, it becomes very overwhelming. And um, by the way, uh, any of the other participants, if you have questions, you can simply ask questions. You don't feel um, that, you know, um, I am busy with uh, answering questions. Um, so you know, just ask your questions if you have. Um, so back to the um, point where a um, lot of my students um, become very overwhelmed because we it is a very um, daunting task. So it's not very easy for people, even though they're hardworking, they collect data, they code them and everything else, but they don't know how to structure this thing. And that's where um, mostly help with pe people with their data analysis and structuring all the information. Um, so you don't have to get overwhelmed by things. You just have to you know, uh, put them uh, in structure one by one. It might take some time, but eventually it turns out to be a very good um, research paper or a book chapter um, or um, no, let me share with you my experience. You know, I really don't trust students with the data collection process. Uh, I feel that they just go out and they just fill the questionnaires themselves and they, they bring it to you. Because I have experiences when I was collecting data on the nurses, I just went to hospital one by one and I went to, uh, went to and I had to go through this ethical process, ethical review committee process. One by one, one by, it was a one year long exercise to collect data, but it was really a genuine and authentic data. So it, it is a time consuming process, uh, but sometimes, you know, I really don't trust the students, but in some cases we have to, because we cannot take the complete load. Uh, in my case, I cannot, uh, I really cannot. Yeah, but there, that's a um, scientifically um, observable phenomena, actually, that most of the research come from the undergraduate students because they're the easily available um, samples. But and there's so many things that you can do um, about that um, because um, I think my test is probably one of the few tests. I started this whole psychometric field in Pakistan in 2012 um, after I written my book. And since then, I've been arguing that um, most of the research um, would be better off if you made online questionnaires um, that are renderable on mobile mobile devices also as well as iPad, which you can give people and um, simply ask them to um, score it through you know the finger touch points. Uh, first, it takes a lot less than the normal paper and pen version, and the margin of error is very low. Uh, your information to, is not incomplete by missing fields and things like this, and you can easily design that. I don't know if you already know about that, but uh, the survey collection tool that is used in most prestigious universities is called Qualtrics. Um, and through Qualtrics, you can um, take not only the information, but it does on the pre preliminary analysis for you also with the means and standard deviations and kurtosis and um, skewness and things like this. So it becomes a lot easier